Now I want to <clears throat> uh, talk about the self-made king. And we talk about we talked about secularism and how Europe had become secular. That was the first really typical uh, aspect of Europe. Now we are going to talk going to talk about expressive individualism, the second uh, characteristic of Europe. In a, a famous book from the um, uh, 40s, I think, uh, Ideas Have Consequences of Richard Weaver. He was not a Christian. He was a kind of nominal Protestant, but a very good book about uh, ideas having consequences, uh, the, much of the theme for this uh, masterclass. He says, the denial of everything transcendent, uh, tr uh, the denial of everything transcending experience means inevitable. The ways are found to hedge on this, the denial of truth. With the denial of objective truth, there is no escape from the relativism of man, the measure of all things. Now, in Christianity, God is at the center. And you can read in Psalms, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. Put your trust in God. Of course, if there is a God, you should rely on him, not on human strength. Now, in the secular perspective, you have the opposite. Secular humanism in Humanist Manifesto uh, number two says, no deity will save us. We must save ourselves. And so human beings have become a self-made king. We have made ourselves to become uh, lords and masters and kings over this creation. There's nothing above us, nothing higher than us. Now, ideas have consequences. What does it mean if there is no God and human beings are uh, at the top, are at the center? So if we are now secular and we have just kicked out God and Christianity from the pic picture, what is replacing God? Well, there is nothing else than the human being. We are putting ourselves in God's place. This is the symbol of the um, international humanist association. It's called Happy Human. And of course, the symbol is a, a human being raising his or her hands uh, in joy, finally free, no God, no norms, no authority, no Bible, no church over me. I'm free. But this first impulse of liberation and joy, I'm free. It, is, it does not last long. You notice it's an, an individual, it's a lonely person. It's one human being. Now that is, of course, the problem with what we have replaced God with ourselves, a small individual human being. But that has become the focal point of our culture now. Charles Taylor, in his, his very famous book, A Secular Age, says, individualism is the normal fruit of human self-regard absent the illusory claims of God, the chain of being, or the sacred order of society. So that follows natural. If there is no God, if that is an illusion with God, there is no chain of being that you are part of, there's no sacred order of society, but you are God. So then, there cannot be an alternative to individualism. And it's often called expressive individualism. Self-focused emphasis on personal happiness and self-actualization, as well as a claim that the internal self is the true self. Now, that is the direction our culture has been moving for a number of decades now. And the full consequences of that has been visible uh, just for uh, the last uh, decades or the last two decades. What is happening is this, and I will quote Carl Rogers, one of the founders of humanistic psychology. He was an American psychologist. And he says this, and I think it captures so much of what's happening in our culture. Experience is for me the highest authority. 
the touchstones of validity is my own experience. No other person's ideas and none of my own ideas are as authoritative as my experience. It is to experience that I must return again and again to discover a closer approximation to truth as it, as it is in the process of becoming in me. Neither the Bible nor the prophets, neither Freud nor research, neither the re revelations of God nor man can take precedence over my own direct experience. So this is what is happening in our culture. We have said no to God. We have put ourselves at the center. And now we put our, <clears throat> not our minds, not our thinking, but our experience at the center. And this has thrown our own culture into a desperate uh, hunt for an experience and of something that can uh, be an experience of my authentic self. Who am I? I want to experience who I am. I want my identity to come from inside because there's no one outside who can tell me who I am. You can say there is a, a, a long line in Western uh, uh, culture moving in that direction, but it has come to full uh, to full fruit now in our time. And I really like the way that Trumpel Sartre, so the picture here is Descartes, Rousseau, Kant, Nietzsche, uh, different philosophers who have, who have moved their culture in this humanistic direction without being full-blown humanists, all of them. But Sartre, he was really that. In his famous book, Existentialism is Humanism, he says, uh, if he is forming a, a phrase that has been uh, uh, world famous. Existence precedes essence. What's the meaning of that cryptic uh, formulation? Well, he explains it very well. He says, before we believed in God. And then we thought that God said, let us make human beings in our image. And then God created human beings in his image. That means that we were in God's mind before we had actual existence. God thought us out. We're thinking about us before he created us. That means that we could say that essence comes before existence. Our essence as human beings were in the mind of God when he, th he thought, let us make human beings into our image, in our likeness. And then he gave us existence. So we had an essence before we came into existence. And then the calling of man was to explore that essence that we already had and to express it. But now, he says, we know there is no God. We don't think there is a God. It means we have not been in a mind before we had existence. So now we are forced to say existence comes before our essence. Existence precedes essence. So we're just thrown into this world. We're given existence, but we have no identity. We have no essence. We are nothing. We have to create ourselves. We have to give ourselves an identity, an essence. I think this captures so much what is going on in our culture today. In addition to this philosophical perspective, where secularism has led to individualism, that has led to this idea that we have no essence. We have, of course, a sociological development within a culture where previously you were an individual, but you belong to a family and a clan of some a wider family. You were part of a culture, maybe a small village or a small town, and there was a certain culture. And in that culture, the, the church had it was very influential and above everyone, there was God who has created everything and, and who was the judge of everyone. And you were giving an identity from those different circles around you. Not all of that was positive, of course. Uh, some of those uh, things were destructive that because you are a woman, it means this, or because you were born into this family, you cannot have an education. So I'm not, I'm not defending all this, but but it was something that gave an individual an identity. And, and ultimately, you had your identity because you were created in the image of God. So you're, you had an identity, there was meaning to your existence, and you were surrounded by those circles that gave you identity and meaning. 
and ultimately God. But now God has gone and many of the other circles have become very loose because of the dissolvement of, of family, because of uh, urbanizations and we move into to big cities, because the church has lost its influence and ultimately because there is no God. And now you are there as an, an individual and you have no given meaning from God and you have much less meaning giving from your surroundings. And now we see this expressive individualism. Individualist. It is a child of the enlightenment of the, of the secular, because there is no God. Therefore, you have to give yourself an identity. So we now see a new way of forming identity without the sacred order, without God and without the sacred order outside you. So now the process of forming your identity, your understanding of yourself has moved from outward previously you got your identity from God and the church and your culture and your family. Now it's coming from inside. You have to find your identity within yourself. There's a change that your identity was formed from duties. You are called to follow God's will. Uh, you need to follow God's law. You need to follow the, uh, the teaching of the church. You need to, to follow what your parents are saying. So there were duties pressed upon you, not all of them uh, good or right or, or positive, but the process was duties from the outside. Now your identity is forming from your desires and there are very few duties from the outside. Your desires has uh, given a new importance. And there is a change from being validated by God or culture or your family, your parents, to being your own validator. You are what you say you are. And you want to be affirmed uh, when you say who you are. This is a huge change in how we form our identity in our culture now. Traditionally, historically, the good was imposed upon you from the outside, ultimately from God through his revelation, that we can know what is good and what is evil, and you are called to follow God's will. So good comes from the outside. Of course, it's, uh, uh, it can be affirmed from the inside, but ultimately is anchored outside you. Through the enlightenment, the intellectual said no to God, but they still maintained a belief in something that is good. And I thought that you, through your mind and reason, can discover what is good, even if there is no God. But now the good is determined by you. You are the one who decides what is good and what is evil. This is a huge change in how we form our identity. We have been a culture where the inner self is elevated to be the ultimate authority such a drastic change in culture. If you compare this to the Christian story, where God is the ultimate uh, authority, and he's a good authority, and therefore uh, it will not destroy you to follow him. Now it is the inner self that is elevated to be the ultimate authority, and you can define yourself in whatever way you want. And I hope you see how this relates to what I started with, the woman who was married to an airplane or that is not women that are pregnant any longer. So this is the most typical for us today, the, the place of the inner self, expressive individualism. Philip uh, Reef, another Amer American sociologist and cultural critic, uh, there is a famous quote from him. He says, religious man was born to be saved and religious man is uh, Western people before the Enlightenment. They, they knew there was a God and they knew their dilemma before God and they, they knew they needed to be saved, forgiven and restored and renewed. Psychological man, that it, it is his term for us in our time, who starts with the inner self. 
we are born to be pleased. We expect that the surroundings, the culture should affirm us and please us, whatever we say about ourselves. We need to add one more thing to this. Through Freud, we have, uh, we have given a special place, place to sexuality and sexual love. And in his book, Civilization and its Discontents, he described sexual love as the prototype of all happiness. This uh, genital eroticism is the central point of life. And he actually means that, that uh, this is the area of life where you can have the, the strongest satisfaction. And it is the point around which you should uh, look for happiness. It is the prototype, the ideal. So he gives sexual love a, a new and elevated position in terms of, of, of happiness and meaning for human beings. Of course, romantic erotic sexual relationships and sexuality has always been important for people but it has been put earlier on in different kinds of contexts and now this uh, sexuality is given uh, the center stage in human life so freud gives sexual gratif gratification as uh, a place where it's central to what it means to be a self to what it means to be a human sexual gratification gratification takes center stage that is a new thing in our culture now let me try to summarize what i've tried to say our culture with its christian history has now reached what can be called a perfect storm a perfect storm is an expression to say you have several different forces uh, coming together, uh, making it uh, much, much more strong. The perfect storm. The perfect storm for our culture is we have rejected God. It's a new idea. There is no God. The universe is all there is. The universe is, is self-explanatory. There's nothing beyond time and space. There's nothing beyond matter and energy. There is no God. The only thing that is real and important is here and now. It is this material life. No God. Because there is no God, there cannot be anything above the human individual. It means the self is placed at the center of the universe. We become uh, individualistic, putting ourselves at the place of God. Of course, we cannot take the place of God, but as best as we can, we are putting ourselves at the center of the universe expressive individualism and thirdly in the self we put sexuality at the center we give sexuality a meaning it did not have before as the, the aspect of life that should provide the uttermost satisfaction and meaning to our individual life. And I think if you if you start to think about our culture with, with those three, from those three points, there is no God. We put the self at the center of the universe and we put sexuality at the center of self. It helps you to understand quite a lot of the strange things that are going on within our culture. We are experiencing a perfect storm, which tries to replace the Christian faith. And I hope you see the logic between no God and then, so the secular, leading on to individual individualism, that the self then naturally becomes the center of the universe. And then, of course, sexuality is a powerful part of the human being. And then, if you want, you can put that at the center of yourself. I will end this, um, this fourth presentation with a quote from the Russian author Dostoevsky. He says, the best way to keep a prisoner from escaping is to make sure he never knows he is in a prison. 
That's a profound insight. The best way to keep a prisoner from escaping is to make sure he never knows he's in a pr prison and therefore never tries to escape. And this is how culture very often works, that it imprisons people within a certain system of ideas, but it does not help the individuals to realize, to see those ideas, to see the prison uh, they are uh, put in, uh, the limitation that those ideas have, the uh, how it um, how they become bound up with those ideas. And our culture is now imprisoning its citizens within the prison of the secular and the uh, individualism and with sexuality at the center of the self. That is the prison we as a culture are living within. But since so few people really formulate and identify those ideas and the prison they form, too few people are trying to escape it because they don't know they are sitting in a prison, to use Dostoevsky's um, uh, word image here. We have one last presentation, and that is about the way forward. So far, uh, I've tried to give you tools on how to understand the chaos, why we have come into this perfect storm. In the last session, we uh, I want to give some perspective on what is the way forward 